I'm Rim. I'm Scott. We are the hosts of Geek Nights. It is a podcast. We've been doing this for a long time. We are ostensibly experts on games, or at least we trick someone into thinking we are, and we're up on this stage. We got free badges. Yes, we got free badges at that, most of you. Yesterday, yeah. we did a panel called The 40 Tabletop Games You Should Play. You might have guessed it's the same people who are back here to do The 40 Games You Must Play. Rim is responsible for the clickbait panels. I do the non-clickbait hey, panels. Hey, clickbait titles get people into the room. No one wants to That's come right. to when our... That's right. I do a high-quality panel, not in clickbait, no one comes. We That's do, like, right. the real harm of games. No one wants to hear about the bad things games might be doing. They want this stuff. So, let's see what this panel is. First off... These are not the best 40 games. Ah. I do not want to even try to make a list of the best 40 games. Also, is that even possible? We are not the authority on the best 40 games. <laughs> Especially not two white guys. And these are not the most important 40 games. We're not going to tell you to go play King's Quest 1. You probably shouldn't go play King's Quest 1. Seeing the screenshot is enough. But <laughs> just because a game was important to the industry, just because a game did something groundbreaking, does not mean it makes this list. It only makes this list if you should play it for some reason. This is not the clickbait panel where two dudes sit there and tell you about their favorite 40 games. Right. I've seen a lot of people out there, they don't have this sort of trouble separating what's good and what's their favorite. Right? It's like, Aerobiz is Rim's favorite. I love that game. That is literally a game where you run board meetings and are the CEO of an airline. <laughs> Aerobiz! Like, oh, I sent my agent to negotiate for slots in Shanghai. I'm gonna open up that route before India does. This is actually Aerobiz Supersonic. There was an Aerobiz 1. This is Aerobiz 2. Like, Do not play Aerobiz! Aerobiz is not good. <laughs> So we some at least believe that we can separate what we like from what is actually good. There are going to be games that we put on this list that we believe are good even though we personally don't like them, right? And that's just how it is. We're not going to talk about a lot of recent games because they haven't stood the test of time. Look at anime as an example. You may love Neon Genesis Evangelion, you may hate Neon Genesis Evangelion, but you got to admit, people are still talking about Neon Genesis <laughs> Evangelion, and there's a reason for that. Same thing with games. There's quite a few reasons for that. There are. But we're not going to talk about games that have come out very recently because it's very easy to overestimate the importance of a game you like that just came out. This list is in a literal random order because I don't care who wins in a fight between Batman and Puerto Rico the board game. Right, basically what's going to happen is I'm going to see, I'm going to see games appearing on this screen and then I'm going to think of what to say. I don't know what order you put the slides in. <laughs> in fact, we are also going to miss a lot of games because I do not need to tell you that StarCraft exists. Also, we're only here for an hour. And I'm not talking any more than an hour. And I do not care if we miss something. Do not try to raise your hand and be like, no, 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 you didn't talk about Quest for Glory 3, hey, the hey, battle for Tarn or whatever that game is called. This game that came out before the game. Yeah, go right And <laughs> unlike our uh, 40 tabletop games panel, where I think we have a little more authority to like, make a, put a rigorous list together, there are, you might be aware of this, more than 40 games on Earth. So it is really hard to make a comprehensive list of games, even 40, that would cover a wide variety of genres. So this list is completely arbitrary based on our gut intuition. Right. There is going to be, I guess, some amount of overlap with yesterday, because tabletop games are games. I, I actually made a very specific point of not, not overlapping <laughs> with the panel we did yesterday. So if you were here because you saw us yesterday, we're not going to talk about that many of those games. More than zero, though. More than zero. This list will change. Every time you see us do this panel, the list changes radically. Rim really wants to get into other packs for free, and this panel's really easy to make. Look, it's not the wrong he has to do <laughs> is change the slides with different games, and then it feels like he's not repeating himself. He <laughs> doesn't have to come up with a new panel, which is hard work. But there's something very important about this panel, because when we first started putting this together, I realized something really sad. A lot of the games that I think you should play are not playable anymore. Who here has played Tribes 2? Ooh, ooh, let's get a game though. I'm oh. a PC after this. We are getting it on. I got my Steam user ready. Tribes 2 was the greatest thing ever, and you basically can't play it anymore. Who has played Weapons Factory for a Quake 2 mod? Okay, the one guy. 
No land party after this song. We gotta talk. You'll have to learn Tribes 2 instead. So the rule is, there are a lot of games we would put on this list. It cannot be on this list unless an average attendee of a convention like PAX could play it with relatively little monetary and informational expenditure. Right, we're like, I have like a computer science degree, so there's a lot more games that I could theoretically make work than the average person, so I have to, you know, those games don't make money. Yeah, if you can get it on eBay, it counts. If you have to like, find a dude who knows a dude, or not. <laughs> you have to install 10 patches and set up a fake server. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't download EXEs in torrents to get these old games to work. Uh, but the important thing, the whole reason we do panels like this, is that one of our shticks with our podcast Geek Nights is that we want people to be, like, cross-pollinated. If you're a nerdy, like, gamer person, we want you to also check out anime, and comics, and computer science, and all that stuff. And in games, it's real easy to just be that person who plays Magic. You've met a lot of those people. This there are people who came to the PAX, they're hanging out on that top floor of the Regency, the seventh floor, and they're playing Magic all weekend. And that's great, Magic is cool. Right? But that's not really what Geek Nights is about, right? So the idea is we want you to play all kinds of games. Games you're not used to, all, you know, games that, you know, you might hate, even you should play them anyway, just to see what the deal is, so you understand them. And then, when you go to play games you like, and you encounter new games, you go, ah, this is like that game I played before, and slowly you reach the expanding brain and the galaxy brain. You become not just a gamer, <laughs> but a player of games. <laughs> Let's get right into it. Dance, oh, yeah. dance, revolution. <laughs> to this day, is probably one of the best rhythm games ever made. And the reason I say that is that there are a lot of rhythm games that are just Tekken or something. Yeah. yeah. There are a lot of rhythm games that try to be real, full-on dancing. Mm, yeah, it's some of the matter of, you know, They're less accuracy. games, they're more subjective. Dance, dance, revolution is this magic mix of it is a real skill-based game that you can have tournaments in, and it is closer to dancing than you might expect. Right, when, you, when I first saw this, I said, wow, that is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. I will never do that. <laughs> and then I was like, oh wait, I am an adult. I will be willing to try anything, no matter how stupid it looks. And then I said, okay, this is really stupid, but I'm going to continue doing it for the next five, six years. I see Scott, <laughs> I see Scott doing this, and I'm like, Scott, that is really stupid. And Scott's like, you should try it. And I was like, okay, yeah, I'll try your stupid dick. Oh, ooh. <laughs> but basically, DDR is like, you know, as far as rhythm games go, this is the best way to experience, you know, the, that, that flow that you have when the game controls you. When you first play, you're trying to look at the arrows and you're like, right? <laughs> and then eventually, it's like, you don't even see the arrows, it's like reading the Matrix, and then, you, like, your legs are just moving. <laughs> and the arrow controls your brain somehow. <laughs> so, you, you know, you want to learn what that feels like. So... Super Mario 3, of all the platformers that have been out there, we always fight with each other whether or not it should be Super Mario World. Super Mario 3 was one of the best-selling video games in history, and there's a reason for it. It is one of the tightest platformers ever made. There's a reason Super Meat Boy is SMB, Super Mario Brothers. Super Meat Boy is a spiritual successor to this crap. It's got tight controls to the point that a lot of people that these days, in like modern Mario games, people complain they feel a little slippery, they feel a little loose. Mario 3 just has this perfect tightness to it, like the timing, the little details. And more importantly, Mario 3 really pushed the limits of the Nintendo Entertainment System. If you play this game and you look at what other Nintendo games looked like, like in that era or earlier Nintendo games, that really shows you the power of a good programmer. <laughs> So I couldn't just say Tigger's and Euphrates again, because we talked about that yesterday. Yeah, but the guy who made this game, Raymond Canisio, one of the best board tabletop game creators ever, who's still making games out there, happened to come out with this like a year or two ago, Yellow and Yanksy. It's basically 90% the same game as the great game Tigger's and Euphrates that he made 20-something years ago. That we still play to this day. He just changed the square map to a hex map, and then adjusted the rules as, you know, as appropriate. And then additionally made some, you know, a little, a little smoothing out, a little polishing of little, little quirky rules in the old TNE. And there you go. Yellow and Yanksy. Sell the game again. So a lot of you might be primarily video gamers. Some of you might be more tabletop -y, But if you haven't played one of those, like, serious-looking German board games that we're all <laughs> playing in the tabletop area, go try one of them There's out. There's a copy but, of this in the, in the library. So. Yeah. These games are not as intimidating as you might think. These games are why we are good at all games. These ga There's a lot to these games, and you really do yourself a disservice if you don't at least try them. Skip the Munch games and all those other tabletop games. Try one of these meaty ones. If you need a meaty one to try, check that game in particular out. Play it with four people, and you might discover a whole new world of gaming. Mm -hmm. So, 
I like to say that Chrono Trigger was both the height and end of a genre. Like, people have been trying to make a spiritual successor or a direct successor, Radical Dreamers, for a long time, and no one succeeded. No one has been able to capture this despite an entire industry desperate to make a sequel to this game. I mean, Why is game, this game is like the perfect storm of JRPGness, right? You have the Akira Toriyama artwork going on, right? You have the Super Nintendo bringing it into full power finally to make something big like this, right? You know, the different endings, all that kind of stuff, right? But the real reason I think this is up here as like the JRPG to play is because most JRPGs are like unplayable grind fests. You can't, you don't have time for that, guy. I love you, Final <laughs> Fantasy IV. <laughs> right. I love you, Final Fantasy Right? Most people seem to be adults. Here, I see some younger people, but it's like you just do not. There's no reason to waste your life grinding and leveling up some character or whatever. Chrono Trigger, you can run past most encounters without having to fight. Yeah. Right? It's just like all those quality of life things that nowadays would be seen as like a luxury. It's like this game had all of them, right? Way before. And then there was like a regression in JRPGs going like back to grinding afterwards. It's like, did you not realize what made this game so great? It was like not having well, to put up with that BS. But it also shows something interesting, because part of what made this game so great, and there are other games this happened to, we'll talk about later on, is that it's really easy to overlook how much human effort it took to make this game. The branching stories, like all the little details, this game cost way too much to make, and took way too long to make, and it is not feasible to make games that way. It never has been, and never will be. This game was a unique product of its time, and nothing will ever be like it again until AIs can just make games for us. AI, yeah, make me a Chrono Trigger. <laughs> so, ever meet some old people, and they're playing, like, Bridge, or Euchre? Has anyone even heard of Euchre, the card game? Okay, okay, okay. okay. A lot of nerds at conventions don't think about card games like hearts when they're thinking about the games they play at PAX. Like when I was a kid, and I would watch anime and be like, oh, I don't watch those American cartoons because I am a proper weeaboo. <laughs> that wasn't even a word when I was a kid. So, don't look overlook these old style trick taking games. And right. If you want to see why, like why they're fun and why people play them and what the deal is, Fantasy Wizard is the way to get into that world. Right now, you could get regular old Wizard. Just grab yourself a deck of cards. I think you have to add maybe like a few jokers to it to like you know turn it into enough cards. You need to play four Zauberers because it's a German game, so those Zauberers are Zauber crafting. I need four Nars to be like the anti gesture wizards or whatever. But you need a little few more cards than fifty two to play. I think you need sixty cards. Yep. But if you get my fantasy wizard, you get this amazing artwork. <laughs> With on it. The best part about this game is we have a friend, his name is Scott Johnson. He looks exactly like one of these cards. Yeah, the two, he's the two of humans. It might as well be his driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the deal with this game is like, trick-taking is a mechanic that is starting to creep into a lot of indie tabletop games. You're seeing trick-taking up here, and you're even seeing game designers designing trick-taking, not knowing it already exists, and giving it weird names and doing it in weird ways. The best thing about trick-taking games is one of those genres where it's like, once you learn one trick-taking game and you learn like the rules and the terminology, I can teach you a new trick-taking game by just saying, oh yeah, we passed three to the left, and this is Trump, and you can also have no Trump, and you have to follow suit, and this and that, and then you know how to play a new trick-taking game. And you can just suddenly, once you learn one, it's like a snowball. You just learn every trick-taking game in the world in like two seconds each. And it was funny, the First time I was trying to teach our friends this game, and I was sort of like, okay, so here's how we pick Trump, and someone's like, what's Trump? And I was like, oh, oh. I actually, and I, it's like I had to teach all these things that I'd never even considered being in a rule book before. I just, I knew them when I was born, I guess, because I was born in Michigan. But you know, Wizard, <laughs> Wizard is like, you know, the, the reason we pick Wizard is not only because you can buy this fun deck of cards, but because it's just really easy, it encompasses all the mechanics, and it has a lot of replay value. Other Some trick taking games. They involve are, cheating and stuff like that you don't want. Yeah, Euchre is only fun if you cheat. Right. So, there's a reason. <laughs> there's a reason Counter Strike is still being talked about, and that's because there's a reason Steam exists. You may forget, many of you may be too young for this, Steam existed solely to patch Counter Strike. Well, I don't know, a lot of people raised their hands for tribes too. Ah. Right? But yeah, back in the day, when you wanted to play Counter Strike, you had your Half Life that you installed from a CD ROM, and you would go to Counter Strike.net, you click a link, and there'd be a list of mirrors that was like five pages long. And you you click on eight of them until you find one that works. You would download a file, run it, and it would install the Counter Strike mod into Half Life. 
And then, you know, Valve was like, man, this is a really awful experience for everyone, and they created Steam, and all Steam did was update Counter-Strike. We, did, we, we <laughs> it didn't do anything. It didn't have a store. It was just a Counter-Strike update. We did a panel back in, like, 20, not 2009, 2010 at PAX West called Egregiously Unrealized Potential, and we were talking about, like, genres that are forgotten or, like, things people don't talk about. We had this beautiful slide. I still have a screenshot of it, and it shows the top five games being played on Steam in that year. Number one was the new Counter-Strike. Number two was the old Counter-Strike. <laughs> Counter-Strike is really important because it's actually really fun, and it's basically the same game, just being like updated slightly as time goes on, and it's still a competitive eSport. It's still real. You should at least see what the deal is. What other game has lasted this long as like a competitive as, yeah. as all the other, like Quake, it's like gone, right? And it's also a very pure and focused experience. It does one thing very well, like very specific kinds of gun drama. So it's a little bit the new hotness. Uh, but I, I'm on the stage, I'll it's say not, this. It's not too soon to say. In my professional opinion, this is the best Zelda game ever made. I'm just going to say it. I'm just going to say it, because this does what they wanted to do with Zelda 1. This evokes the feelings that they were going for with Zelda 1. Technology just limited them. Yeah, I mean, I still, like, I feel in my heart that, like, Zelda 1 is still the real best Zelda, but it's like, I think back to when I was a kid, and I was like, yeah, I was just burning every bush, yeah. bombing every rock. <laughs> I memorized the, I know that map better than I know the map of, like, New York City, where I live, <laughs> right? But I see new people trying to play Zelda 1, and they, like, don't even know what to do, and it's like, mm, that's a problem. Yeah. And it's partly game expectations. Like, I had very different expectations of games back in the NES era. So in the modern era, this game gives kids and just adults and really anyone today the same feeling I got when I was a little kid. And I put that gold cartridge in my NES for the first time, not even knowing what to expect. This game is a triumph. And the other thing about this game is that it made every other open world game look like garbage. <laughs> so... Mm. Metroidvania has been a popular genre for a long time, and people really focus on the Vania side of that, and they kind of forget the Metroid side of that. Yeah, I mean, if you look around, you know, since the, a lot of indie games keep trying to make Metroidvanias, right? There's like Hollow Knight, which is pretty good, right? What's in some other ones? There's I mean, Bloodstained Ritual Complex. of the Night is actually good. Yeah, so. that's good, but it's more of a Symphony of the Night than a Super Metroid, right? There's a Shadow Complex thing that was really good, but really small. Right? And it's like, even after all these years, much like with the Chrono Trigger situation, it's like, no one's still really beaten Super Metroid at its own game. Not even other Metroid games. <laughs> Super Metroid, if you just play it on an emulator today, or you have an SNES, it feels like a game that might have been made by an indie developer today. Like, it's a pretty tight experience. That is pretty rare for SNES games. But yeah, if you, you know, you've probably seen people play Super Metroid, maybe, you know, you've probably heard of it, but it's like, it's surprising how many people haven't actually sat down and beaten this thing. It's kind of hard, actually. It's like surprising. Like, you don't think it's that hard because, you know, you just walk around and shoot guys. It doesn't seem like too many bad guys, but, like, even professional people playing this game die a lot, uh, especially at particular bosses. But it's not so difficult that you can't, you know, level up your skills and beat it. And those skills transfer to a lot of other video games. So if you get good enough to beat Super Metroid, there's not a lot of, you know, video games you're not going to be able to beat, except for, like, the stupidly, you know, fake hard ones. But it also shows, like, in the Metroidvania genre, the, the Vania side of it is a lot about leveling up, giving your character, like, more capabilities based on numbers and stats and hitting things and, like, magic spells and all that. The Metroid side is more about the exploration, irrespective of leveling up. You don't level up by killing dudes in Metroid. You level up by finding an item that gives you a new power. More like a Zelda game. So they are very distinct genres that got merged into one genre. I think we're going to see them separate again in the coming decade of indie development. Sumer is a way to experience what it feels like to play this old PC game called Mule, crossed with a German board game like Yellow and Yangtze, on a Nintendo Switch. Right. So, we, so we beta tested this game. It's not like the greatest game in the history of the world, but it is super duper unique. I've never seen a game do what this does. This game, Sumer, this little indie game, which is like, it's been at PAX before, I think, mm -hmm. yeah, in the NS Ball, is basically a board game, except there's a real-time component. 
and they've just implemented the real-time component as platforming. Real-time so, worker placement. Run to the spot you need, quickly. Right. So, whereas, like, you play a board game, and it's, like, maybe, like, Agricola, if anyone knows that game. It's, like, I choose, like, you know, get cheap. I choose make a baby. You take turns. Here, it's, like, all right, everyone, one, two, three, go, and you run, and one person's running for the wheat, and another person's running for the goat, and another person's running for the, you know, bath, or whatever it is, right? And then I'm just alone, like, oh, oh, crap. Right, and I guess I'll take... And it's, like, I guess I'll go to the bakery that's left. I don't know. I don't have any meat, though. It also does the thing that Mule did, old PC game, but this idea of we have these auctions, you're like bidding on a power. And the auctions are real time too. You just drag your slider of how much you're willing to bid, and you see everyone else's sliders in real time. And everyone's just moving their bids like this constantly. You're pushing up, pushing up. The last second you fall back, and the other person pays a lot more. Yeah, the timer runs out, and then that's what everyone pays. It's real fun. Hey, the nothing, currency is good, by the way. There is nothing else like this. Yeah, there's no other game like that. So, yeah, it's Dig Dug. I wore a Dig Dug shirt today, and I wore a Dig Dug shirt yesterday. We, uh, if we like Dig Dug. Any Dig Dug shirts I don't have, let me know. Dig Dug 2 <laughs> is pretty good as well, but we're talking about Dig Dug. Here's the deal most old arcade games, not actually that fun. No, and a lot not of them. Not actually that good. And a lot of them that are fun are only fun in like a very short window, right? It's like you play some Space Invaders, there's a Missile Command, or something like that, right? And it's like, alright, alright, this is fun. And you level 1, you level 2, and it's like it's the same level over and over. And there's not a lot. Once you get good at it, it's like I saw a guy breaking like an Asteroids world record. And it's like you literally would go and play some asteroids to get a bunch of lives, then like walk away, go to the bathroom, eat lunch, take a break, and then come back to it and still be alive. It wouldn't be game over. And then you play some more, get the score up, right? And it's just like this endurance thing with all most of those old games, right? How long can you keep going? How long can you keep the score going up? Dig Dug has lots and lots and lots of nuance, and there's not a lot of endurance because you're going to die. Yep. <laughs> Even if you're good at this game, like 15, 20 levels in, you're going to reach your limit unless you are a professional. And it, there, it's like other games, you just learn a few techniques. In Dig Dug, it's like it's surprising how many higher level techniques you can learn as the game goes on. It's like at first, you're waiting for a guy to trap him under a rock. Then you're pumping guys to pause them underneath the rock and then releasing the rock, right? It's, 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 and you're it's, kiting like eight guys at the same time on both sides of you with like... You're yeah. getting your, you're tricking guys to come to the bottom of the board because there are more points if you kill them down there. So this is the game to play if you want to really experience what old arcade games were like without playing all the bad ones. <laughs> so how many of you have played Dungeons & Dragons? Most of them. How many of you have played an RPG that is not Dungeons and Dragons, and not Palladium, and not uh, Wait, any D20 not type Wolf, thing? Not a Pathfinder. Pathfinder goes down. Okay. I've right, got some people guys. out there. Okay. Anyway, but basically, most RPGs out there are basically just D and D with some different name on it. Pathfinder is D and D, right? It's the same freaking game, right? You're in dungeons. You have stats. It's mostly about killing monsters and leveling up and all that stuff, right? Burning Wheel is the RPG that made me realize, oh, that's not what all RPGs have to be. Yep, this nerdy dude by the name of Luke Crane was at some dumpy convention in New Jersey, and I was walking by his table, and he's trying to get me to play his indie RPG, and I really did not want anything to do with this guy. But <laughs> I sat down, I thought, okay, what, is it D&D with D30s? Like, what have you figured out? And then I had an experience. So I came back and like, Scott, there's a game other than D&D, &D. and Scott was like, bullshit. I was like, no. <laughs> I was like, I've seen those other games, I've seen the GURPS and the Rifts, so I don't have to go anywhere near those. We don't have time to get into like the deal with this game, so we're trying to talk about 40 games, but I'll put it this way. Here's an example of how this game works. You know in D&D, &D, you write your backstory. My uncle was Kelvin Blackstaff, and I am a half-elf with gold-flecked purple eyes, and no one well, that's your that. backstory. That's everyone. That's, that's a lot of people. Someone, <laughs> someone else writes a backstory like that. I know you're out there. Yeah, I see you. I see you. And no one cares about that because that stuff does not translate into the stats on your sheet or any of the rules of the game. It's just there. In Burning Wheel, you can say your character's Harry. That doesn't mean anything. Whatever, he's Harry. If you spend points on him being Harry, he's Harry to the point that it matters. You write the word <laughs> in the trait section on your character sheet, you write Harry. And then later in the game, it's like, oh, you're, you're yeah, uh, a snowstorm comes in and you're trapped out in the cave. It's getting cold. I'm Harry. <laughs> I'm fine. Uh, I guess you get plus one on your plus one, uh, you know, dice on here's, your roll. Here's right? another example. You write in your backstory, Kelvin Blackstaff is my uncle, and the DM's like, yeah, sure, whatever. In this game, if you spend points, Kelvin Blackstaff is your uncle. 
That's it. You bought and then, it. It's like he's yours. You're in a town. It's like, oh, I go into town to find Kelvin Blackstaff in this town. And it's like, you're the player and you're saying that someone's in the town. And you roll the dice and the dice will say whether he's in the town or not. And if you fail, well, he's not in the town, but maybe someone else is. <laughs> but here, here's the nuance. Here's where you can see why this RPG is so amazing. It costs 15 points to buy someone like Kelvin Blackstaff to be your uncle. It costs 14 points if he hates you. Because <laughs> you play D and D, failure is way more fun than success, and this is an RPG that embraces that. <laughs> Move around. A little bit. We're not joking. We were at a party a few years ago, and the kids were like all, all our friends' kids started playing tag. And we were like, oh, we'll play tag with you. And we started to get a little competitive, a little serious. And then we scared the kids away, and now it's a bunch of 30-year-olds running around playing tag. Tag ain't bad. I mean, I've seen that, like, professional tag on, like, you know, YouTube or something. Yeah, you don't need to do that. <laughs> I kind of want to get into that. That's all you. Omegathon finale. Just tag on Just tag. tag. That's a little dumb. Two people. So... But, but I mean, we put tag up here, but what we really mean is you should play sports, right? Nerd, you know, there tends to be this dividing line between like nerds and sports, but like sports are games, you know, sports are just a subset of games. Sports belong at PAX. Look at a photo of any sporting event, half those dudes are cosplaying. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing is, we played two games this weekend that were board games that had a mechanic that we both recognize, because we do a lot of game design consulting and stuff, and we're like, that's just a no tag backs rule. Ooh, tags rules are pretty elegant when you think about it, and especially if you look at the advanced no tag back rule, and if you understand why that is a rule. All right, here's a weird indie Japanese- Why didn't you put the picture in the middle of the, of the slide? Because I, I updated these slides like last night. Okay, good. So, here's the deal. This is a cooperative trick-taking game. We're like a co-op trick-taking trick game. Yeah, but this is a co-op trick-taking game. Ooh. You're all trying to beat the board, but you still can't talk to each other. You still can't cheat like you would in Euchre. You've got to play tricks and buy the cards you're playing, like in trick-taking games, imply to the other people at the table what they should play so you achieve the correct outcome. This game is unique and amazing, and the main reason you should play it is not just for all that, but because it's a Japanese indie game. The Japanese indie tabletop scene is exploding right now, and there is some neat stuff coming out of there. And not just Japan, but it's like, you know, obviously Europe for board games, but it's like, there's a whole world, right, that we live on, and a lot of people only look at the things that they can find easily in their own language. I go through a lot of effort to find out, like, what music is coming out of, you know, some crazy countries in Africa, and like, you know, what board games are being made in Russia. It's like, you know, go out and look at whatever you're into, Go find what's happening on some, you know, in the, just in the present, but in the past, in other parts of the world. It's like there are all these hidden gems you've just never been able to see, and now we have internet, so they don't need to be hidden from you anymore. So, this is the only good WarioWare game. There are a lot, so if you don't know, this is the GameCube WarioWare. There are many other WarioWares. This is the one. And there's a big reason for this. This was the era when Nintendo, I think, was the most innovative they had been in a long time. When they made the game, GBA Link Controller, connect Game Boy Advances, two GameCubes, and they made like four ultimate gaming experiences, and then they just gave up on that for like 15 years. I don't know why we can't like have four Switches with one TV and have the same thing going on. I, I don't know why either. But here's the deal. This is the only WarioWare that has actual, real, serious, good multiplayer. And it is amazing. Right, the Wii had multiplayer, but it was garbage. Warrior where multiplayer. You don't want that. The we don't have time to. Is where it's at. We don't have time to really explain the mechanics of like why this in particular. But what I can say is that this is a party game that does what you expect modern Mario parties to do, but they never really deliver. This is the game that actually delivers that experience. And you don't have to spend four hours like you do with Mario Party. And it is real easy to get a GameCube and find a disc of this game and just make it work. It is well worth your effort. <laughs> All right, so who here likes trivia games? Anybody? Not too many? Oh, okay, some number of people. But the thing with trivia games is that if it's trivia that you know, or the whole group sort of has, you know, you know it enough, then it can be fun. But if you bust out Trivial Pursuit and it's like, oh, who acted in this movie in like 1970-something? It's like, you don't freaking know. No, it's boring and stupid, right? You either know or you don't. 
So the way to make a good trivia game is to make it where anyone can play no matter how much they know. Someone who knows everything can play it and enjoy it, and someone who knows nothing can still play and enjoy and score some points. This is a game called America. It had a trivia about American things, but it was actually the mechanics come from another game called Fauna, which Fauna. has animal trivia. So you By uh, Friedman Fries. The guy who made Power Grid. Yeah, Power Grid guy. Right. But yeah, so either game is the same mechanics. One of them is animal trivia, one of them is American trivia. But the way it works is that you have a card, and so say, you know, it'll be like there's a card for M&Ms, because that's an American thing, uh, yeah. right? And it was like, okay, what year was M&Ms invented? How many M&Ms do Americans eat every year? And what was the, and what was the third thing? You're like, what state was the oh, right. first M&M state, What state is the M&M like invented in, right? So now what everyone does is you, there's three tracks. It's a year track. There's a number track, and there's a map of the U.S. And you put one marker on the number track, one on the year track, and one on the state. And you're trying to guess, right, which is the right more like a three questions. More like a German board game. Like, I think Scott knows about this. I see he put his, like, cube on Massachusetts. I'm going to go next to Massachusetts. And I'll still get some points if he's right. That's right. It's like horseshoes. Just being close, you still get points. So, like, I know everyone knows the answer is New York. Oh, my God. It's yeah. like, well, Rim goes first. He took New York. I'll just take Connecticut and get my one point. Yep. This is the first trivia game I've ever actually liked. So, I want to tell you to play Weapons Factory in Quake 2, because that's kind of what this game is based on. This game is also based on another mod of Quake 2 called Action Quake, which Action Quake ended up splitting, and Action Quake was the inspiration for both Overwatch and for Counter-Strike. Uh, this game is the only modern game that has taken all of those game design principles for those kinds of old multiplayer team versus FPSs and made a modern game for them. This is how to experience that entire era of gaming in one game. And I'm not just saying that because I play this game every goddamn day. You play this game every goddamn day. I do play this game every day. I have been waiting my entire life since high school to play Weapons Factory for Quake 2 again. The only thing that could have prevented this was Tribes 2 not dying. If Tribes 2 still existed, I would never have touched Overwatch. <laughs> but <clears throat> Overwatch, seriously, if you play it, you should do your research and like try to find like people writing or talking about all the older games that inspired it. Listen to the developers and the designers of this game and the talks they've given and the interviews they've given, they've given because they are very open about what inspired this game. And this game is like this ultimate expression of multiple old genres that have died, reinvented for the modern era. Don't want to put a lot of VR games up. VR is just now hitting this awesome point where it's moving from the like niche market or core market to the expanded market. It's not mainstream. Grandma's not buying an Oculus anytime soon. Right. It's, it's hard to recommend VR games because even if you know some people have the money and the space to buy them and set them up, it's like, okay, well, that's not a great investment right now. There's not too many games. You know, there are like 12 good VR games total. Right. You know, but Maybe also 13. some people you know, are unable to play VR games just because the accessibility of the thing. They might vomit or something. Right? Yeah, this is still early days of VR. But I guess if you're going to play a VR game, this is the one. You can play this game super high actually without VR, and it's still pretty fun, but VR makes it a little bit better. Well, it makes it, the thing is, this is a, like, peak gaming experience, because VR is something entirely new. I mean, yes, there was VR in the 90s, it was also known as a turbo vomit machine. It was also, yeah, VR in the 90s is just a TV on your head, right? VR in the 2010s is a little bit different. Go find a YouTube video about Sega's attempt to make a VR headset. It is terrifying. The deal with this game in VR is that the enemies only move when you move. So you're standing there not moving, and a guy is there with a gun in your face. You start to move a little bit, he starts to move a little bit, you stop, he stops. But it's your whole body. It's like being in the Matrix. Right. You like lean back and then grab the gun out of his hand and shoot him. It is such a weird experience, it breaks your brain. You take the headset off, and it feels weird to be in the real world again. Where the people move without you moving? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> stop so I can catch my breath, but no, you guys keep moving. <laughs> yeah, but if you play on the mouse and keyboard, right, it's a little bit less fun, because you just take your hands away from the mouse and keyboard and sit there and think about it, right? And you can move, right? This but if you play VR, it's like, you know, you have to sort of hold your body in place. This game will show you the, like, radical potential of VR, even though we're far from fully realizing that. So, there's Talked a Battletech video yesterday. game. Overlap. Yeah, there's a Battletech video game. It's really fun. You should play it. But you're really, to appreciate Battletech and to appreciate what your computer is doing for you when you play a complex game, you should fill in all these little dots when your leg gets shot and then roll on a table to find out if the ammo explosion kills you. 
Battletech, you know, we said this yesterday, but most of you weren't here yesterday. Battletech is like the most complex tabletop warish game that you can actually reasonably play. It looks scarier than it is. Most of the game is just roll 2d6, look at a table, it tells you who, you, if you hit, where you hit, and how much you hit, and then you have fun filling in bubbles. And then the best part is after you fill in the bubbles, because that's when all the storytelling happens. It's like, oh, you got hit in the arm. Well, how much damage to the arm? Oh, that much? All right, let's roll some money. Oh, your arm fell off. It's on the ground. <laughs> and it's can like, I, and can then, I kick my arm up and hit him with it? Yeah, roll 2d6. <laughs> you can do, there's, it's a crate, it's even, not, there's a bunch of extra rule books, but like, you don't actually need those. The regular old rule book has the rules for all sorts of ridiculous things. Like, just about anything you would think you would want to do with a mech. I want to kick him. Okay. I want to jump on his head. Okay. I want to take the ammo out of my body and like smash someone with it. Okay. Instead of a metal, can I just buy 400 Jeeps? Right. Yeah. You also get the fun of customization. I want a mech that's nothing but lasers. Okay. <laughs> my mech is overheating. I jump in the water. It cools you off. It works. Your mech wouldn't have overheated if you had more than just a million small lasers. Right. It's like, everything is awesome in, in Battletech, so it's, it's worth your time. So, you gotta play a civilization game. And you Why can't... is the screenshot Civ 2 when you've written Civ 5 6? Because <laughs> as much as I want you to play Civ 2, that ship has sailed. I found my Civ 2 CD ROM the other day. Oh, I uh, pirated Civ 2 when I was a kid because I didn't know you could pirate software. Someone just gave me a CD and I was like, oh, cool, a game. <laughs> Civilization 5? was a complete, radical, real, like, redesign of Civilization games. If you haven't played a Civ game since Civ 2, uh, let us never speak of Civ 3, or Civ 4. Civ 4 is okay. It's yeah, Civ 3. Civ 3 is the worst. I have no go. son. Right. But Civ 5 or 6, they're both really different from each other. Like, it's wor like I have a Civ 5 game going on and a Civ 6 game going on both right now. Yep. Right. Civ, uh, this is what's fascinating. Civ 6 did not replace Civ 5. You think of most games, like, a game comes out, then there's Call of Duty 2, Call of Duty 3, Call of Duty 4. You kind of replace them as you go on. Civ 5 and Civ 6 are both equally fun games that are very different and you play them for different reasons. But the game I really want to talk about is playing these games with other human beings. That is a completely different experience. Right, so the AIs in all these Civ games are not the best. Even though they've been better or worse over time, you really get the game going when you play it against only other human beings and no weird AIs messing up your game, right? Now, in the game, they have some built-in mechanisms to let you do this. They've always been flaky, garbage, breaky, not good. They even just added Play by Cloud to Civ 6. It doesn't work that way. 100%. I play a lot of Play by Mail Civilization. In fact, I have a game I'm in right now that's going. Games he's in right now. See, oh, no, the, and then it says All Games 5. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I am in a Civ, Civ 5 game that I've been playing for more than two years. Because I play a turn every few days, and I've just been doing this for a long time. I just wake up in the morning, and my computer, there's little pop-ups that say if it's my turn, I take my turn, it takes five minutes, and then that's it. But really with, a game, with a game like this, the first point is that when you're playing with human beings, you can talk to them like human beings and have intrigue and politics. And our friend fucking Scott Johnson got the entire world to ally against me. Good. And then the entire world came upon my shores and destroyed me one day. Good. <laughs> the AI is never going to pull that off. But two... You play these games like single player and you kind of blow through turns and you start to get like you don't pay attention that much. When you take one turn, and that's the only turn you're taking that day, you click on all the things you wouldn't normally click on. You look inside your cities, you play the game with a lot more care, you understand the game a lot better, and the game is a lot more fun. Decisions matter a lot more when you're playing slow with other human beings. You can also do what I do, which is take your turn, don't push the next turn button, think about it, push load, take the turn again, Think about what's going on. I refuse to do that because I am... Uh, I, I optimize my turn perfectly by redoing it over and over. I have like pride and right. confidence in my abilities. Yeah, I have pride and so I make sure I win. But if you, want, <laughs> if you want to play Civ 5 multiplayer, use this tool called Giant Multiplayer Robot. It's on the internet, it's free, it just And works. if you want to play Civ 6, you have to use a different tool called Play Your Damn Turn. Which is also the name... That's the name of it, yeah. It's also the name of a panel we're going to probably run at PAX Unplugged. Hopefully Teach no how to one will come looking for Civ 6, because that won't be us. <laughs> so, I don't need to Why tell you... Why did you put that no one can play this? Yes, they can. It's on good old games. You can just oh, get it. This game's really easy to get. Okay. So, 
There's a lot of adventure games. Like, I don't need to tell, like, Sam and Max games, they come back. That genre... All those point and click adventure games of the olden days and the newer Telltale ones. Or yep. Whatever they come, those, that genre got reinvented a million times. They're back. You can play them. Of all the types of adventure games that were on PCs in the early days, the Quest for Glory series was the weird one. It was different, it was unique compared to the Scum games, every other kind of adventure game. These games were very open world. Every problem has multiple solutions. The games are shockingly complex, and kind of like Chrono Trigger, no one has ever made adventure games again like Quest for Glories. And I say that even knowing that they, re that they made Quest for Glory 5. <laughs> Quest for Glory 1, 2, 3, and 4 are like this, not a dead end, but like an evolution of gaming that just sort of stopped for no reason. And I think this is a genre that is ripe to be brought back that would compete very strongly with the kinds of adventure games we're seeing today. And just no one's done it yet. So it's like watching an old experimental movie from like maybe the 60s, and mm -hmm. it's like, how come no one's made a movie like that in the last 50, 60 years? This yeah. is super old and has like invented something crazy that no one's ever taken on. How so did that happen? of the four of these games that were made, that one too is probably the best one to play. It's a, like, you can play it with a modern sensibility. It's not like the adventure games you're thinking of, like where you have to take the banana and shove it through the door and that's how you solve the puzzle to kill the Nazi. Like it's weird. <laughs> Everything makes sense in this game. And that is kind of amazing for an old PC game. Oh, our stuff. Our stuff. Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of these, you know, magic-ish games out there, right? You know, you play cards, you collect them, you customize your deck, you follow the meta, things change, right? Hearthstone is A, the cheapest, because you can just play for free. You don't need to bring in and pay money unless you want to win, which you don't really need to, because you're only going to play this for like a week or two, right? <laughs> uh, but the thing that Hearthstone does that none of these other games I've seen do is that it knows it's a digital game, right? If you play Magic Online Arena, right, that is still based on real Magic. It's still good. It's a, it's a great way to play Magic. But it's based on real magic, so all the cards are cards that are from the real world. They are cards that you can use in the real world. Hearthstone is like, yeah, this card in your hand transforms into a different card every turn. This card plays a random card from all the possible cards in all of Hearthstone when you play it, right? Oh yeah, you add 20 cards to your deck out of nowhere when you play this card. It does all sorts of crazy things that are not possible in a physical card game. Right? It's only in a digital card game can these things happen, and that's what the insanely fun part comes from. So pay zero dollars to play our stuff. So we got another RPG here. This game has been re-released. It's a uh, role-playing game by Morgan Baker called A Thousand and One Nights. And it's like an Arabian Nights theme where you all play people in the Sultan's Court. No one's the Sultan. You're just all chilling in the Sultan's Court, lounging on some pillows. And by the way, when you play the game, you have to lounge. And you have to get, like, you know, some dinner. Get some, like, like, get some dates. Get some vase. Get yeah. a character. Get some wines. But here's the deal. You play a character in the Sultan's Court. And what do you do in the Sultan's Court? You play role-playing games. <laughs> you play a character playing a character. And that sounds insane. All right. So I'm in the Sultan's Court, right? And I'm, like, a eunuch in the Sultan's Court. And I'm telling a story about something, and now this story that I'm telling, all these people who have characters in the Sultan's Court are now acting as characters in my story that I'm telling in the Sultan's Court, <laughs> to entertain the Sultan. And the Sultan's not known as the Sultan, the Sultan's in the But in the court, crazy. I may have some intrigue, like, I don't like the eunuch. So I like to start to tell my story, and I'm just making my scene, and I tell the story of a dashing Don Juan, and of course I'll play the dashing Don Juan, and I'll make someone else be the eunuch, and say the person I asked to play the eunuch, who is not Scott, because Scott is the eunuch in the real world, well, in the real world of the game, <laughs> the person playing the eunuch has a crunch against Scott. So he comes into the scene, in the game we're playing, inside of the game, der de der look at me, I am the eunuch and I am stupid. Because <laughs> you can't insult people in the court. You can insult them in the D&D &D game you're playing in the court. <laughs> this game is amazing. It sounds hard, but once you sit down to do it, it'll take five minutes and you'll be like, oh, okay. It's amazing how well people... As long as you don't add one more inception, though. <laughs> <laughs> You can't be like, ah, oh, one time we were playing a thousand and one night. <laughs> <laughs> so, I say Doom 2 specifically because... It's better what, than Doom 1. It is kind of better than Doom 1, <laughs> but more importantly, what's one of the iconic things of Doom? That double barrel shotgun. That wasn't in Doom 1. That's the main reason Doom 2 is better than Doom 1. <laughs> Doom 2 was made to include the double barrel shotgun. Doom 1, one barrel. Doom 2, <laughs> two barrel. <laughs> 
But yeah, Doom is, you know, historic, it is remembered, it is like legendary because it's amazing. It's surprising how many people haven't played Doom. It's not that hard to play. I and mean, guess there was a period of time where in order to play Doom, you had to like get a WAD file and install a thing. But now Doom is on the Switch. Yeah. You, know, you can go to Steam, double click and play Doom. And because it's only 2.5D, it's not actually three dimensional, it's fine to play without a mouse and keyboard. Like the controllers were You don't fine. actually have to look up and down. If the imp is way up high, you just shoot at it and the rocket will just sort of go up. It's really easy. <laughs> But the best thing about Doom 2 is that it's completely different from all the modern FPSs you may have played in two ways. Number one, it's fast. Really fast. Not quite fast, but still crazy fast. You'll die fast, you run fast, you shoot fast. Yep. And also, there's bad guys just everywhere. It's like sea of bad guys. It's not like, you know, you're, you're sort of dodging and trying to shoot one guy. It's like, no, you go in a room, there's like a hundred demons. <laughs> and you moan down! <laughs> Serious Sam tried to recreate some of those elements, but it didn't get all of them. It's Serious Sam was more dodging a hundred guys, yep. or Doom is more shooting a hundred guys. Doom 2 is like legit worth playing and fun to play today. I bought it on the Switch so we could review it, and I caught myself kind of just playing it pretty late into the night, because Doom 2 is a really fun game. The other thing that Doom 1 and 2 have that has been lost in more modern FPSs is the maze-like quality that comes from Wolfenstein 3D, which predated Doom, right? It's like all those FPSs, Doom, Wolfenstein 3D, Doom 1, Doom 2, were about mazes, trying to find the exit in this crazy, weird freaking map that makes no sense. And then after that, they tried to make maps based on sort of like real world locations that make sense and you don't get lost. And also, if you think like game modding is a relatively new thing, this was the first real FPS because Wolfenstein was more of a puzzle game than a first person shooter. Shooting was secondary to like the other of Wolfenstein. Wolfenstein 3 was really mostly the maze with a little bit of shooting. This was a lot of shooting and a maze. But there was a huge modding scene around this game and people were making crazy mods even back then. Also, mazes are fun. Mazes! So, we were talking about sports. Jungle Speed is a tabletop sport. <laughs> A very uh, dangerous tabletop sport, which has recently become more dangerous. Yeah, you flip cards around and eventually a thing happens, and then you gotta grab that heavy piece of wood before someone else grabs that heavy piece of wood. And uh, I just want to point out, this is truly a sport. <laughs> <laughs> and what I want to point out is that this is on the Story Games discussion forum, and that is Jason Morningstar, the designer of Fiasco. In 2006, Jason Morningstar broke his friend's, friend's finger. His friend Adam, sorry. Yes, Adam. playing a tabletop sport. So yeah, sports. This game, there's a lot of copies of this in the H Tabletop HQ library, but those copies will come with the rubbery dog toy totem for babies who don't want to break their finger. So you go, if you're not a baby, you should go and buy a new Jungle Speed, which has recently been re-released with a wooden totem. <laughs> I think also the French version never got rid of the wooden totem, so go French people. We have a friend who's an enforcer for, in Australia, and he's a, he's a chill dude. But he, like, he's a machine worker, so he made a metal totem. <laughs> Don't do that. He broke his finger the first time they played, and then he vowed to never play with it again. <laughs> uh, if you want to have fun, you can also mod Jungle Speed a little bit. You're supposed to put the totem in the middle of the table with an equal reach of all players. But, you know, some people got a long arm. The tables over at the Regency are, like, huge tables. Not really good for Jungle Speed. Yep. Uh, just put the totem in, like, another room or something, and then... <laughs> <laughs> Just hide, leave the totem somewhere in the expo hall. <laughs> All right, the cockroach poker. So or, uh, who here's cocker lock and poker? Who here's played like uh, some some bluffing games? Like say you like bullshit. You ever played that? Or, like yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Cockroach poker is cockroach poker. Cockroach poker. Cocker lock and poker. Right. This is the ultimate bluffing game. All you got is a deck of cards with eight different bugs. Right. Eight copies of each. Sixty-four cards. And you, all you do is you pick one, you slide that someone, and you're like, yo, this is a rat. No, it's not. Oh, it is. Crap. Right. Now I gotta take it. Right. Oh, here's a bat. That's not a bat. Oh, it wasn't a bat. Take uh, it back. Uh, right? And you think, oh, that's really simple. No, no, you play this game. The best part about this game is that you do all this bluffing and have a lot of fun being like, it's a rat, it's a bat, it's a toad. At the end of the game, one person loses and everyone else wins. <laughs> <laughs> the same bug in front of you, you lose, and everyone else goes, woo! So if you got a bunch of sore losers you want to play with, or some kids who are all, you know, yappy or whatever, and they're getting upset when they lose, <laughs> at least only one person will be upset, and you yeah. can all join together and, like, make fun of them. <laughs> <laughs> Can't tell a lie. This is an example of one of those games you can use to trick your, like, relatives who don't play games into playing a game that's actually pretty good. Cool. My mom played this game right away. She got it, right? It takes two seconds to explain the rules. It's just a deck of cards. You can carry it from anywhere. Really good. Yup. 
All right. So, I don't like Fortnite at all, but I, I understand it. I played PUBG. Though. Yeah, Fortnite, PUBG, all these games. There's a reason this is the biggest genre in gaming right now, and you really need to understand and play these games to see what the deal is, because people, kids especially, are not playing these games the way you may think they are. In Fortnite, they're not that competitive. They hardly shoot at each other. They, like, hang out in Fortnite like it's a chat room. They, you know what they do? They do in Fortnite what we did with Command & Conquer 1. No rush, 20 minutes. I want to build my base first. <laughs> PUBG is like, I, I was almost going to say the thinking man's Fortnite. <laughs> no, Fortnite PUBG is, is the weirdo Fortnite for Fortnite weirdos like second, us. So it can't, PUBG can't be the anything Fortnite. Yeah. <laughs> but PUBG, like, PUBG and Fortnite ostensibly are the same game. All these, like, Battle Royale games are ostensibly the same game, but design-wise, they are radically different. They have radically different player bases for very interesting reasons. And this is a space you need to understand. Play Fortnite at least once. To see what the deal is. It's free, at least. Then play PUBG, and then wonder That's why people like us play PUBG, because that game is just a nightmare, and I love it. <laughs> PUBG, Fortnite is running around, hitting people with baseball bats, and screaming, and yelling, and flying through the sky. PUBG is hiding in the corner, trying not to breathe, hoping no one sees you for 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> again today. I worked again last year and the year before. So here's the deal. I played Magic the Gathering and I love the hell out of it. the years 1992, 3, and 4. Uh, but when Fallen Empires, the expansion came out, I thought it was kind of weak compared to the previous expansions, like Lucky the Dark. Week. And I felt like the game was dying. And when 4th edition came out, I quit playing Magic because I thought it was dead. And shows what I know. <laughs> That also shows how old I am. One year after you. Yep. That was it. The last tournament I played in, alliances weren't allowed to be used because it was too new. <laughs> so, the deal with magic is that love or hate magic, the money aspects, everything else, there's one thing you cannot deny. It's still around and it's bigger than ever. And there is a reason for that. The other thing you cannot deny, and this is a very interesting like game mechanic, like game design, game industry thing, I haven't really played Magic much since 1994, 1995, and yet if I went into the Magic area at this con, I sat down, I took some random deck from someone, I could just play Magic. Mostly. You'd Mostly. You'd read some cards, you'd be a little slow. I'd have to read the cards, there's a couple of rules I'd have to like learn about a little you'd bit. Mess because mess up probably, you'd also lose, for I mean, sure. I mean, phasing, <laughs> phasing appeared. I don't like, know what that is. Yeah, banding did not. <laughs> banding is something that does not exist anymore for a reason. Okay. But Magic's rules are shockingly consistent from when I was a little kid to today, despite the game having such a radical evolution. There's also so many things that Magic invented game wise that you see in like tons and tons and tons of other games, not just collectible card games, but board games and all sorts of other, even non tabletop games. And it's like all those things were invented by Magic. Right. The concept of tapping, like that was a good, people were like, how do I like figure cards out having, which like, cards were used? In the corner of how much it costs to play the card, it was like, yeah. invented by magic basically. And also many of you, thing. many of you might be too young to remember that magic was one of many collectible card games when the genre appeared, and the rest of them are terrible to a degree that is unfathomable. <laughs> I played that D&D one, I played Jihad, I played the Star Wars CCG, I had the Sim City CCG. <laughs> I'm not making that up. There's a Star Trek one too. Oh yeah, Streets of Rage 4 is coming out. You should play Streets of Rage 1 and 2 because they have the best soundtracks of like almost any video game ever. And, you know, it's a walk sideways beat guys up game. Just about as good as every other walk sideways beat guys up game. <laughs> All right? So, I mean, you just need something to do and push some buttons when you listen to the best soundtrack ever. But also, walk sideways and beat dudes up games are pretty fun, but they tend to fall into these very simple patterns. Take any walk sideways beat dudes up game from all of history, and they're all pretty much the same. Yeah, you can play, you know, River City Ransom's a little different. Yeah. Because that's a little RPG element. But it's like, you know, you can play this, or Final Fight, or, you know, Ninja Turtles, or X-Men, or, yep, or the Simpsons, know, Simpsons one. one. It's like, this, you know, you can see how old we are. <laughs> but it's like, any of them are just about the same. Just play the one with the best music, which is Streets of Rage 1 and 2, and Streets of Rage 4 is coming soon, so that's looking good too. Yep, but also it's an interesting, it's sort of, it's sort of continuity. Like, these games are 80% style. 
Like, the style and the characters and the music are what make us love some of these games and hate some of these other games. The mechanics usually don't even matter that much. They just have to be good enough. Oh, there was a Scott Pilgrim one, too. That was the Scott game. Pilgrim one was really good, and it's gone. Like, it's almost impossible to play that game. Is I would, it? Yeah. Mm. I would, like DuckTales. You can't buy DuckTales anymore. Oh, they took it off Steam. Right? Yeah. Yeah, the remaster. Whatever. I would tell you to play the Scott Pilgrim game, but it's really hard to get a hold of. Alright. So, you might have played Dominion, yeah. a deck builder game. Well, what if a deck builder was made one player, and what if a deck builder was actually a roguelike video game on the Switch that's like 20 bucks? Well, you can get it on Steam. Steam first, right? But yeah, they actually did come out with this on Switch. I think iOS is going to come eventually. But yeah, this is a roguelike game, so it's like you start the game, you pick a character, and you're trying to get from the, to the beginning to the end in one shot. If you die, it's over. you got to start again, right? And it's stateful, right? You've got this deck of cards, and after every fight, you add a card to your deck. And when you get to a shop, you can spend your money to like, remove cards from your deck, or buy items, or you know, buy potions, and things of that nature. And when you beat certain bosses, you get the items and relics and things. And you enter all these different fights, and every fight, you draw cards from your deck, you shuffle up your deck, draw some cards, and you get a certain amount of energy each turn, so you get a free energy. And you try to kill all the bad guys before you die. It'll give you the same, same feelings as like FTL, like a very similar game in terms of like how you engage with it, but instead of the mechanic being build a spaceship and manage it, the mechanic is just play this card game while you fight monsters. This game is really addictive. Right, and you, you don't level up, you just improve your deck. You get rid of the crappy cards, you put in the good cards, you put in cards that are stronger, more powerful, have combos with each other, right, have nice synergies, like the shiv deck and the poison deck, yeah. right? all poison cards. I got 780 block the other night. Yeah, you're basically invincible with that, right? The thing is, it's a one-player game. A lot of people worry about game balance. In a one-player game, you don't need any balance, just let it be crazy. Right, sure, you're, that's you're awesome. cheating the computer? <laughs> All right, we'll go real quick on this. Eat Poop You Cat is a game you can all play. You just take a bunch of pieces of paper. This, these are some pictures of us playing the game. You, everyone writes a sentence. You pass the paper to the left, you read the sentence, you draw what it is, fold the paper over, pass it to the left. The next person looks at the picture, writes a sentence. Fold it over, pass it to the left, look at the sentence, right. draw a picture. Just keep going. Right, this so somehow I started by, in my bad handwriting, writing two people eating a cactus. Emily drew a really cute picture of two people eating a cactus. And then eventually, somehow at the end, it ended up being someone murdered the chair puppies. No, these are two, these are two different games. Oh, they're two different ones? Yeah. Oh, okay. That's I felt bad for those chair puppies. Oh, okay. Sometimes simple games are real fun. This is like analog jackbox. Right, well, I mean, if you play telephone, right, where you whisper in someone's ear around the circle, this is just fax machine. You just have to alternate between words and pictures. All right, we got four minutes left, so we're going to go a little quicker on the last few games. All right. Uh, Undertale Meh. is a... So I told you, Scouts doesn't even like all these games. I don't like this game. You know what I would say about Undertale? It's important for a lot of reasons, but it has the best score. Not soundtrack, but the best score of any video game in recent history. And I will stand by that. That is the hill I will die on. Alright, you're dead. <laughs> Advance Wars is something I want to tell you to play, but it's kind of hard to play unless you got some old... If there uh, was a world champion of Advance Wars, it might be there. I, I, I have S-ranked everything you can S-rank in every Advance Wars that's ever been released. If you want to experience a, like... Game that is like Fire Emblem, but actually a strategy and tactics game, as opposed to a dating simulator. <laughs> Wargroove on the Switch or on Steam will give you the same feelings I get playing Advance Wars. Alright, so there are a lot of Mario Karts. I'm sure you've played whatever your favorite Mario Kart is. GBA Super Circuit Mario Kart is the one I played the most, and it's also the best one. And the reason it's the best one is because it's the only skill-based Mario Kart there is. If you drive other, perfectly... If you drive absolutely perfectly, you drift around every corner, right? You don't mess up, you don't go in the dirt, you don't do anything stupid, the blue shell will hound your ass and never touch you. As soon as you mess up, oh, that blue shell comes. But as long as you drive perfectly, if you're the best driver, no number of blue... The red shell will just give up. You're like, ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> so if you want a real racing game with still having the fun of Mario Kart, get the GBA one. Alright, three minutes left. Speed round. This is an NES game remade with modern sensibilities. It's amazing and unique and there's nothing else like it and pretend there are no sequels. <laughs> it's an actual scary game. It is a horror game that says, you know what? Jump scares scare people. We're just gonna make jump scares. We're gonna do jump scares in a really interesting mechanical way where the jump scare is almost the goal. So you can startle yourself as an adult who isn't afraid in haunted houses. This game is like a masterclass in limited player interaction design. 
Street Fighter 2. I was like, going to say, it's the first one. It's the second one, but really it's the first one. There were fighting games before Street Fighter 2. This is actually super duper Street Fighter 2 with all kinds of characters. The first one only had like, you know, eight or whatever yeah. characters. But the point is, it was the first fighting game that actually had different characters to choose from that were all different. And that's why Street Fighter is still a big deal after all this time. This is poker designed by a game designer as opposed to history. Also with pandas and fun. <laughs> Puzzly games like this, where it's versus puzzle, that is still to this day the best one other than Battle Balls, but there's no way you can play right. Battle of Balls. Of the non-Tetris puzzle games, too many of them are just panel de pawn. Magical Drop is the real shit for the hardcore puzzle people. Backgammon. <laughs> but here's the, don't just play backgammon. Backgammon by itself, the way a lot of people play it, is a terrible game. You have to play backgammon with the doubling cube for points. We don't have time to talk about why. The doubling cube is how old men gamble in backgammon. The best reason to play backgammon is so that you can make friends with old men anywhere on the earth. That's a picture of <laughs> That's a picture you of this symbol. You see some old guys, boom, you're in. <laughs> but go read up. The doubling cube, the way you gamble in backgammon, was invented in the United States. Learn like, also Not the that name, long ago. Learn the name for backgammon in the language of the place you are going. <laughs> <laughs> and last and least... If you want to go back to basics, you want to play an Atari game, Atari games are hot garbage, that is one of four really, really good Atari games. Pretzel Cowboy. Is Pretzel Cowboy. One of the best, like, two-player direct person video games on Earth. I legit love this game and will play it this day. We are out of time. I hope this was enjoyable.